Well, I want to bring you from Esther chapter 4, two texts and two challenges. And you'll find the outline of the sermon on the back of the notice sheet. Two texts and two challenges. The first text comes from Mordecai's words to Esther for such a time as this. And I want to challenge you to recognize every time as a time appointed by God. I want you to grow in your ability to trust God. For most of us exercise selective trust in God. We trust God in some areas, at some times, in some moods, in some circumstances. But our selective trust is also a limited trust, at times a half trust, uh, an occasional trust, a paralyzed trust, a double-minded trust. Purity of heart is to will one thing, and I want you to grow in trusting God. There's the first text and the first challenge. The second text comes from Esther's words, If I perish, I perish. And I want to challenge you to grow in your love for God's people. For if we naturally tend to exercise selective trust, we also tend to exercise selective love. We love lovable people. We love attractive people, which means we love people like ourselves. We love people we admire. We love people when we're in the right mood. We love people who do what we want. And yet our love is occasional. Well, mine is anyway. I'm happy to love when it's convenient, when I choose, to a limited extent, when I'm in the right mood, and as long as it doesn't require too much sacrifice, then I'm cheerfully happy to love the people of God. Well, we've met the four important people in the book of Esther. Ahasuerus is the great king of Persia. Mordecai is a humble Jew, possibly a civil servant. Esther is the girl, the relative he has brought up, who has now become Ahasuerus's queen. And Haman is described as the enemy of of the Jews. He's been deeply offended because Mordecai won't give him the respect that he thinks is his due and so has manipulated the weak king Ahasuerus into ordering the annihilation of all the Jews in the Persian Empire. Well, we meet Mordecai at the beginning of chapter 4. Mordecai, by the way, had instructed Esther to keep quiet about being a Jew. Unlike Daniel, whom you might remember from the book of that name, who was uh, very brave about being a Jew in Babylon, very brave about being a public believer in the one true and living God, Mordecai thought it was wiser to keep quiet about it and told Esther to do the same. And whereas Daniel had uh, refused the special food, Esther had undergone the year-long beauty treatment, which is a compromise uh, too far, in my opinion. And Mordecai, who'd formerly kept quiet about being a Jew, is now, of course, a public example. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, that is, by Haman, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on 
sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried with a loud and bitter cry. And here he is making a public example of himself as one of the Jews who is destined to be killed in 11 months' time. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And not only Mordecai, we read in verse 3 of chapter 4, but in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Well, inside the palace, inside the harem, is Esther. And when Esther's young women and eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai, but he would not accept them. So Esther called for Hattak, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, ordered him to go out to Mordecai to learn why this was and what this was and why it was. So Hattak went out to Mordecai. Mordecai told him all that had happened, the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther. Well, Hattak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. But Esther's reply was, no, I can't do anything. Everyone knows that if a man or woman goes into the king inside the inner court without being asked, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come in to the king these 30 days. Well... Mordecai's reply is fascinating. Don't think that you yourself in the king's palace will escape any more than all the other Jews. If you keep silent, relief and deliverance will arise from Jews from another place, great statement of faith, but you and your father's house will perish. And then the challenge, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We tend to read those words, whether you've come to the kingdom, with spiritual ears, and we think, well, that means God's kingdom. But of course, it doesn't mean God's kingdom, it means the kingdom of Persia. And the challenge that Mordecai is putting to Esther is to trust God that God has placed her in this kingdom in this secular place, if you like, at this time for this opportunity. As Charles Spurgeon, the Baptist preacher, wrote, everything the most minute as well as the most magnificent is ordered by the Lord whose kingdom rules over all. And even in this prolonged exile, far from Jerusalem, far from the temple, far from the Holy Land, far from all the visible signs of God's will and God's mercy and God's promises, even here in Persia, even here in Susa, even here in the king's palace, God is using the smallest events. For God places us in unexpected places, sometimes uncomfortable places, sometimes what we might think of as unpromising places. The last thing you'd expect would be to find an opportunity to serve God and his gospel plan and his plan. It's like guidance, isn't it? Sometimes we feel guided to do things. Other times it's only when you look back over a number of years you can see the fact that God was directing your life even in the smallest detail, even in the chance encounter, even in the chance conversation, the thing you read by accident. God has been at work. And that is exactly how the sovereign power of God works in our world. As Paul puts it in Romans, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. 
all things work together for good. In the old days, Christians used to think that what we saw was the backside of a tapestry. You know, if you look at the backside of a tapestry, it's a great mess of bits of this and that. But if you turn the tapestry around, there's a wonderful picture. And they said, well, when we get to heaven, we'll see the wonderful picture. But now we just see the backside of the tapestry. But for those of you who haven't seen the backside of a tapestry, I try to think of a contemporary example. This is the one I worked out. It's like watching telly and you know when the aerial goes wrong and the thing goes all blurry because a bat's run past or something like that uh, and uh, all of a sudden uh, you lose that wonderful picture of Mount Everest or that wonderful sight of Miss Marple's nose wrinkling which means she's about to solve yet another murder or you miss that rare sight of an Australian winning a mental medal at an Olympic Games. Then the bat moves on and the picture comes back and you see things perfectly clearly. Well, most of our time is spent looking at faulty televisions where we don't see everything, but we have to trust that there is a perfect God with a perfect plan and a perfect picture. See, I love saying to people who are dying, who are believers in Christ, you are perfectly safe in the hands of God. It's a great privilege. And what I say to a dying believer, of course, I can say to any believer at any time, you are perfectly safe in the hands of God. And what I say to any believer, I can say to any church, even a church under persecution, you are perfectly safe in the hands of God. Who knows if you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. There are different times in our lives, but this time for Esther is a time of opportunity, of possibility. Not one that she has chosen, of course. It's all very well for us to create opportunities to serve God. Praise God when we can do that and praise God when he blesses us and uses our strategy and our work. But so often we don't choose opportunities, they choose us. Or rather God chooses to give us opportunities when we least expect them in the most unpromising of circumstances. A couple of years ago, I was serving as an expert witness in a court case in Melbourne that related to gay rights. And my ideas were not very popular in the court. I was being interrogated by the lawyer, of course, and the judge intervened with some of her own questions. I had referred to helping someone become a Christian and what kind of standards I would require of that person before they were baptized, that was the question. So the question, the judge asked the question, how would you help someone become a Christian? So I prayed quietly and then thought, what a great opportunity. So I explained as at great length as I possibly could (laughs) how someone might become a Christian and what they would need to know and who they would need to trust and what the results would be. The judge thanked me for my comments and I hope, I hope, I believe that was a God-given opportunity, you see. Well, what's Esther's decision? Here is Esther's moment, Esther's time, Esther's opportunity. She might die in the attempt, as we read. If she goes to the king, her husband, without being invited, she might be put to death. She might fail. But here was the opportunity for such a time as this. And her response? Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, hold a fast on my behalf. I and my young women will fast as you do, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, 
and if I perish, I perish. What a great test that was. Not an opportunity that she'd created for herself. She was not certain that it would do any good because she might just appear before the king and be struck down dead. Not even have a chance to plea for her people. And not even certain that if she did plea for the deliverance of her people that her plea would be heeded and that she would rescue her people. And notice too that she's alone in making this decision. I feel so sorry for her. Mordecai, of course, can't enter the harem. He's outside, her great supporter. And she doesn't exactly have a supportive and loving husband ready to cherish her and serve her, does he? Because he might well put her to death. And yet, you see, God, Esther is able to save God's people from extinction. She has moved from being a beauty queen to a saint, a sex symbol to an intercessor, a passive victim of circumstances to a risk and death risking saviour. Notice that Esther recognised that God had brought her to this place, this time, this opportunity. She trusted the hidden hand of God, his providential rule. She knew that nothing happens by accident, that all our times are in the hands of God. Her gravestone might read, she died for nothing. But it could also read, she died serving God and loving the people of God. Well, she calls for prayer, a very wise thing to do. For she knew that without God's work, what she would be of no value. She called her fellow believers to pray. If I perish, I perish. Better to serve God if I fail than to fail to serve God. A good friend of mine had Esther 4.16 in his favorite Bible verse, if I perish, I perish. He was a great man for lost causes, a graduate of Oxford, I think. And uh, whenever he embraced another lost cause, he would say, if I perish, I perish. Well, you might dare to be a Daniel. Would you dare to be an Esther? Because I want you to learn to follow Esther and her willingness to suffer and die for the sake of God's people. I want you to learn to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters in big ways and small ways. If we read in 1 John... We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. And again, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Or as Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. A friend of mine was preaching at a sermon of a young father who'd been on a picnic with another Christian family. One of the other children had fallen into the river and this young father had leapt into the river to save the child. The child was saved and he drowned. What a tragedy. Well, the preacher pointed out, we naturally think of this as a tragedy. It's actually a triumph. For as the preacher pointed out, Jesus said, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. We shouldn't think of this action as extraordinary, but ordinary, as we show our love for each other in self-sacrifice and service. Well, you might think Esther had a great, extraordinary opportunity. If I had that kind of opportunity, it'd be worth doing. 
But what does it matter what I do? You miss the point. The message is not that one day you might be Queen of Persia or President of the United States of America and have great opportunities. The point is that every believer is called to imitate Christ and we are called to lay down our lives for other believers every day. And how do we do that? We do that in the churches we belong to by honoring others, by serving others, by setting aside our own preferences in favor of others, by giving practical help to those in need, by welcoming those who are not like us, by praying for people, encouraging them, not insisting in our own way, by giving the saints time and attention, by welcoming hospitality, by supporting others in ministry, and by caring for brothers and sisters under persecution or in great need around the world. And if we follow Esther, we'll find that we're following Jesus Christ who laid down his life for his friends. Why is it so difficult to love people? To live above with the saints we love would all be bliss and glory. To live below with the saints we know is quite a different story. For it's in the small attitudes and actions of love which are the most costly, aren't they? Perhaps we're divided over big and significant issues in our churches. We find it hard to love and serve people who are so clearly wrong. Or it may be that the smallest and most trivial aspects of others make it so hard for us to love and serve them. Or we may decide that we can't put up with them, we won't do them any harm, but that's not enough, of course. We're called to lay down our lives for others. And if that's what God wants, then we're actually harming people by not treating them as God wants us to do. Well, I, for myself, I don't mind loving people when I'm ready to do it, when I choose to do it when I have the energy and time to do it, when it's in my diary. I'm a happy servant when I choose the time, place, and action. And that's why I find Esther such a great challenge. She didn't choose the time, place, or action. They chose her. Or rather, God chose her. Well, Loving God's people is very demanding, and some of you in the building know that very well. For some of you in the building who've been long-term members of St. Helens have been loving and serving people sacrificially for years. But I want to say to you that God loves you for that service and that love. Of course, God loves you because you are in his Son. But God also loves you because you are like his Son in serving others. I love those moments in the book of Revelation and the letters to the churches where Jesus says, I know your works. Nobody else might recognize what people have done in those churches or the cost of their good works, but Jesus knows them. And dear friends, when you hear Jesus' words, well done, good and faithful servant, it will all be worthwhile. Perhaps you need a break from one ministry I used to say that to people at St. Jude's when I was the vicar there. You've done this ministry for eight or ten years, take a break, let somebody else have a go. Don't feel you have to have your nose to the grindstone forever. But perhaps there's another ministry you could take up with the same self-sacrifice. And to those of you who are part of this church but not yet involved in 
loving, self-sacrificial service and you count yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, a follower of Christ, then now is a good time to start. And if you're thinking of joining this church, then please consider not just what you're going to get, but what you'll give as well. Because you want to be like the Lord Jesus, don't you? Laying down your life for others. Do you remember Jesus' comment on people like Ahasuerus? Those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The not so with you is so powerful, isn't it? For our default setting is to want to be served. Our default setting is to come to church as consumers for what we want. But the not so with you cuts across all our assumptions and preferences. For serving others is not only the call of Christ, but also the means he used to save us as he gave his life as a ransom for many on the cross, his crucial act of service. I want you to take risks by growing in faith and growing in in love. I'm a bit nervous about this. I was preaching at a suburban church in Melbourne two years ago and I challenged the congregation to say to God, please do anything to make me grow in holiness. And I was told that one young woman who was present prayed that prayer and has had a very difficult life ever since because God has been answering her prayer and challenging her to grow in holiness. And you say, if you say to God, well, please help me grow in my trust of you, how will God do that? Well, he will encourage you from the scriptures with the great promises that he gives us about why we should trust in God, why we must trust in God. But he'll also put you out of your depth in difficult circumstances so your faith can grow. How else does faith in God grow but by being tested? like my training for the Olympics you know the only way to train is to experience more pain every day otherwise you're not growing in your fitness whatever it was I forget now but anyway I was training for something you only it's it's only by 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 pressuring yourself that you grow in fitness and it's only by being under the pressure of God that you grow in faith so if you pray to God please help me grow in faith How will God answer that? The answer is he'll put you in situations where your faith is tested beyond what you think you can endure, that your faith in God might grow. And if you pray, God, please help me to love St. Helens. Please help me to love my fellow believers in my home church. Please help me to love the Christians I know. Well, how will God do that? The answer is by putting the most difficult person in your path and saying go to it. Please don't say by the way I regard you as a difficult person put in my path to help me love God. That would not be a loving thing to do. But quietly, silently praise God for this opportunity. I feel a hypocrite saying so because I resist this so strongly myself. You see, if you know that God has placed you where you are you'll be more likely to say with Esther, if I perish, I perish. The more you trust God, the more you'll be able to love God's people 
whatever the cost. The more you trust God, the more you'll be able to love God's people, whatever the cost. Remember Esther. Follow Christ. Let us pray. I want to pray two prayers. The first prayer is a prayer about going in our trust in God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you would grow our trust in you. We believe, help our unbelief. Help us to trust you at all times, in all situations, in all circumstances. Please grow our faith by testing us and challenging us. Please grant us more trust in you and help us to exercise more trust in you. Help us believe your promises in the Bible, trust your sovereign power, trust your Son, our Saviour, trust your transforming grace, trust you for every details of our lives and for our past, present and future. Help us to trust you when we are strong and when we are weak, when we are well and when we suffer, and help us to trust you for your church and for your gospel plan for this world. In Jesus' name, amen. And then a prayer that God would help us to grow in loving each other. Gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you would grow our love for our fellow believers. Help us to love them at all times, in all situations and all circumstances. Help us to go in practical service, in forgiveness and understanding, in hospitality, in acceptance, in welcoming people we don't know and in welcoming people who aren't like us. Increase our prayer for each other. Give us opportunities to encourage one another. Please increase our love for this church and for all your people scattered throughout this world. Please work in our lives to challenge us to increase our love and give us opportunities to do it. In Jesus' name, amen.